All right, everyone, here we go with the notes for Chapter 11, turning our attention now to radio, looking at music radio programming in particular with this chapter. It's hard to overstate the impact of media consolidation that came out of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. For station groups, who the competition is had significantly altered not just in terms of the uh, ownership rules, but also in the ways that regulations have loosened up for all different sorts of media. As far as ownership goes, though, a single owner can now own five, six, or up to eight stations in a single market. Most of the listening in a market is typically controlled by two or three owners. Many times within a market, you will have a couple of major players that own a majority of the stations, and then you'll have uh, possibly some medium companies that own a couple of stations and still a couple of lingering mom and pops that are uh, still around and about. But largely, radio is owned by large corporate entities these days. Program directors working with station clusters need to understand their company's vision of the radio market and the roles of their particular stations in their company's overall strategy. In other words, programmers need to be brand managers. They're not necessarily just looking at the overall well-being of their particular station, assuming they're only programming one station. They need to look at the cluster and the company as a whole. I know that in some markets, some of the radio stations that are owned by a particular company intentionally try not to do as well in order to protect the top rated station in the market. Sometimes sounds counterintuitive, but when you're looking at the bottom line of the company as a whole, sometimes that is a strategy. Two factors, the super fast growth of digital media platforms, particularly internet streaming, mobile phones, that sort of thing, and the convergence of various media forms. So mobile apps kind of coming in here. Uh, it makes it essential to now take a broad view of the elements that make up successful radio programming. You can't just rely on one particular medium these days to reach your target audience because your target audience is everywhere. So the importance of social media in particular has become hugely important the ability to access content through several different means becoming hugely important. We've seen examples of that when we've talked about various apps and platforms for the television folks. It's true for radio as well. Now, let's go into a little bit of history here. With, uh, with television taking away the appeal of programs on radio back in the 50s into the 60s, the local radio station no longer tried to supply all types of programming to all people some of the time, but instead offered the most important programming to some of the people all of the time. The format approach created a new golden age for radio. Radio no longer being the go-to place for everybody in the family to consume content together. So it becomes a format by which uh, stations are now catering to certain tastes, uh, reaching out to certain types of people with certain interests. So you have the various formats and music becoming more and more important. The original Top 40 format was not music genre specific. Uh, top 40 could feature uh, the most popular uh, rock songs, pop songs, country songs, as long as it was a top hit, as long as it was on the charts, uh, you could hear just about everything. It was about being popular. Uh, however, there would be times that the music would be adjusted uh, by day part, by certain times of the day, to cater to particular audiences. 
Radio stations soon found it necessary, though, to fine-tune their formats to target a specific audience all of the time. And this is what we call segmentation. Uh, the idea that uh, you are reaching out to a particular demographic uh, shows that you are uh, trying to reach that certain segment of the population. Uh, if you want to talk, uh, rather, if you want to take a look and see how the evolution of various formats came about, uh, there's some pretty good descriptions in your textbook. Uh, so they've gone from rather broad spectrum of uh, formats like pop and rock and country and have become much more segmented to where uh, it's not it's not unbelievable that we have pretty close to a hundred different formats that you might hear on various radio stations and these days other platforms as well. The major differences between new audio media such as cable and satellite and internet and what have traditionally been called radio stations are that broadcast radio and HD radio retain a local focus and they're available to the audience at no additional cost beyond getting a receiver. You go to the store, buy a radio, $10, $15, $5 at a thrift store, whatever, and you can pick up any radio station that broadcasts in your area. Uh, and because it's within that certain geographic limitation of how a radio station broadcasts, the idea that it is the local station for your area also has a certain sort of appeal that is hard to duplicate when it comes to other forms of media. Now, as far as to what to put on that station, good programming is carefully designed to appeal to particular listeners. A smart program director always tailors a station's programming to the available target audience within the market it serves. So you're trying to appeal to various tastes that the format would serve and it's not just necessarily a uh, one-size-fits-all that, for example, country stations in Raleigh are going to appeal uh, in the same way that a country station in Austin or Los Angeles or Seattle would. But you have to know your particular market as well. So it goes back to the idea of knowing your particular audience. Now... Terrestrial radio, the stuff that you pick up with an antenna. Digital audio broadcasting, or DAB, has been supplementing both terrestrial AM and FM analog broadcasting for several years. The U.S. has chosen to create an in-band on-channel system, IBOC for short, and this operates within the current AM and FM spectrum allocations and is totally compatible with existing AM and FM systems. By the way, when you see HD, when it applies to radio, we are not talking about high definition. HD, from a radio perspective, stands for hybrid digital. Hybrid because it works alongside the analog uh, part of the spectrum. So HD in radio means hybrid digital. Digital FM allows for simulcasting, uh, which is repeating the main analog signal, and it also will allow for multicasting of other streams of audio. And these streams can offer specialized formats. They might be leased to other broadcast outlets. Some of the uh, multicast streams will be a repeat of certain AMs that a station group might own. Uh, if you want to see a list of how they work in our markets, there's the uh, the website on your screen there. You can take a look, put in your zip code, and see the HD stations that might be available to you. Uh, if you put in specifically a zip code for Raleigh or Greensboro, you'll see all of the offerings uh, that uh, are in the market. Uh, Fayetteville also has a few offerings much more limited in scope than the other two markets. But uh, within Raleigh, at least, there's several examples of different ways that the HD uh, multi-channel 
streams are being used to either provide a uh, specialized format or to be a repeater of a low power FM or a repeater of an AM signal, uh, sometimes being leased out to another group uh, that is not owned by that particular radio station uh, to allow them to stream content on one of their multicast channels. There's various different ways that these HD channels are being used. Now, as far as cable radio goes, many formats are available as part of a subscription package. Some services also offer their channels online. And many times these are going to be advertised or supported. Uh, there may still be some cable services that provide commercial free audio streams. Now, as far as satellite radio is concerned, DARS, Digital Audio Radio Service, this refers to the high-powered national satellite signals that require only a small receiving antenna that is especially suited to cars and to mobile media. Sirius XM programming is also available online, either as a value-added bonus of a satellite subscription or as a standalone offering. Uh, so we see more and more that uh, various types of media that used to be distinct from each other are all blending together to have uh, their particular service, uh, their particular media uh, available in that form factor, but also making the content available online. As far as online audio goes, two major categories here. First off, streaming audio, what we also call webcasting. Uh, basically, this is the idea that content is being delivered in real time over the network to a computer. So it is, uh, by all intents and purposes, live programming. Podcasting is more archival in nature. Pre-recorded content downloaded from a provider's website to a computer and can then be transferred to another listening device. Podcasts seldom, though, include popular music, mostly because of music licensing issues, and they're primarily filled with spoken word. It's not impossible to find a podcast that includes a lot of music, but generally the rights to retransmit that audio uh, make it such that for many podcasters, it's uh, cost prohibitive to do so. Broadcast radio and the internet. Some broadcasters still shun online, seeing it as a distant second to their terrestrial signal. They argue that it's the over-the-air station that pays the bills and efforts to put in place secondary media would cannibalize their listening audience. As its history shows, though, radio stations have repeatedly been forced to adapt to technological changes and increased competition for the audience and advertisers. As people keep moving towards new media, radio has found itself in a position where it needs to embrace new media more and more, even with the higher costs of um, licensing rights to air music. Uh, many stations are now finding it uh, a necessary thing to do to make themselves relevant to the listeners of their area. Some stations are even starting to realize that online streams can help supplement uh, the, their ability to broadcast, especially if they tend to have a weaker broadcast signal and not everybody in the market can pick up uh, their station over use of a regular radio. And we're also starting to see more and more people understanding somewhat of a value when it comes to advertising to where many stations are now having separate streams uh, with the same audio content, both online and over the air. But the commercial content might be different uh, between those two forms. Uh, iHeart radio stations tend to do that a lot. And there's other groups that do that as well. To maximize their audience and the value of other programming, smart programmers leverage their existing audience goodwill and brand recognition in order to aggressively court the online and mobile audiences while not forgetting the traditional and, in most cases, larger 
broadcast audience. Uh, there's going to be times where uh, perhaps there are different needs and different expectations between the over-the-air listeners and the online listeners, and trying to find the right balance between the two uh, can be a challenging task depending on uh, the way that you structure your programming and uh, how popular one is versus the other. The stations that were most successful in the mid-2000s realized that by offering compelling original content, they were able to attract audiences that actually helped increase traditional station listenership. And, as a bonus, online provided an additional outlet for revenue to advertisers. So what we're talking about here uh, may be in addition to the broadcast streams uh, that we're talking about specialized content that might be available on a website, maybe like a, uh, an extra sort of bonus audio from your morning team uh, or uh, providing other types of in-depth sort of things that perhaps there wasn't enough time uh, on the radio station for or would go a little more in depth, maybe exclusive content that's not really radio friendly. Some stations do that at times as well. But to try to make the online landscape work in the radio station's favor to help to create a continued momentum uh, that goes beyond the radio station, but allows the online to supplement what the radio station itself actually does. During this time, the added revenue streams from digital properties and station events become known as non-traditional revenue, NTR. Uh, basically, you can put non-traditional revenue as anything that is not on-air advertising. Uh, so uh, commercials that don't uh, air on the radio station, they air online, that's non-traditional revenue. Website banners, non-traditional revenue. Uh remote broadcasts, uh, various other, any other way that a radio station makes money that does not involve a commercial on the broadcast airwaves. That's NTR. Currently, there is a per-performance royalty rate scale in place with varying rates for broadcasters, statutory webcasters, and pure play webcasters. So we'll talk about licensing a little bit later on in the chapter. But the short of it is that the licenses that radio stations pay uh, to be able to play music on the air, those fees are royalties to the songwriters of the songs. That's not money that goes to the artists, unless the artist happens to be the songwriter. Uh, and the rationale there is that record companies saw radio as a means of promoting their artists. So they were more than happy to allow radio stations to play the music because it prompted people to listen to their artists and possibly either buy albums or go to artist concerts and things like that. Little bit of a different landscape in the online world where the licensing rights uh, are royalties paid to both songwriters and to artists. And because you don't have the geographic limitations online that you do in radio, there's a different fee structure as well when it comes to uh, how much uh, stations play, uh, stations pay rather, per play of a particular song and how that is calculated based on the online station's reach and frequency and all those sorts of things. Some individual stations have launched their own branded apps, but apps that aggregate many stations and other audio content nationally or globally really dominate the market. Uh, while a station may try to push its own branded individual app, uh, by, for the most part, unless you have a very loyal online listener, um, it's more likely that people will listen to their favorite radio stations through a service like TuneIn or iHeartRadio. One of radio's inherent strengths continues to be 
localism, which means keeping people informed of what is going on in a specific community or a group of communities. Some stations will separate local content from online feeds. We talked about that earlier. Uh, but the idea that, again, radio strength, when they use it to its best advantage, is that it is a station that serves a local area. And there's that that intimacy that we talk about with uh, with radio, that it's a strong suit, that uh, listeners feel like uh, it's almost kind of a one on one experience uh, as they listen to a radio station that is magnified when a station is really good at playing up its localism aspect. So let's go ahead and take a break here. We'll continue on with section three of your notes over at part B of chapter 11.